Hi guys, we're back again with sessions 13. Today we're going to discuss what is called respiratory distress and assessment and intervention. Please excuse my voice. <clears throat> I just wanted you to know that there's so many things to talk about. We're not going to be able to go into great detail. But if you go to dearnurses.com and look at assessment from head to toe part two, you are likely to learn a lot. You might also want to try dearnurses.net scattered throughout the clinical settings step by step. There are numerous topics associated with respiratory distress like ARDS. Uh, we're going to talk about pneumonia and hypoxia, congestive heart failure, hemothorax, adult respiratory distress syndrome, and cardiopulmonary arrest. First of all, let's talk a little about the patient who arrives in the emergency room. Here is the case of a 21-year-old male. He was brought to the ER, and this is not uncommon to have people in distress brought into the ER. You can find out more by going to the clinical setting step-by-step -step, chapter 8. And he's in obvious distress. Oxygen saturation is only 86. Respirations are only 6. He winds up on a ventilator, but before that, other things have to be looked at. How about his arterial blood gases? This is a way to analyze the blood to tell whether a patient is getting enough oxygen. He obviously wasn't. He had a condition which was called hypoxemia, which means that there was not enough oxygen in the blood. So he had to be put on a ventilator in order to assist him. An endotracheal tube was put in place, as you can see here. Oxygen saturation will obviously improve and respirations once he gets intubated. When a patient is put on a ventilator, many times you're going to have patients really frightened. This is not unusual for a patient to be really scared. Family members are in a panic. You need to go and reassure them, reassure that patient. And again, if you go to uh, dearnurses.net, respiratory distress chapter 8, you'll find out a lot about that topic. <clears throat> now, uh, I believe chapter 5 and 8 all have topics on respiratory distress. Distress 5, 8, 2, that's just all over the place. A patient in respiratory distress, like I told you, will become very anxious. Here is this patient who is in congestive heart failure crying out to his nurse, nurse, help me, I cannot breathe. These patients, usually, they're gasping for air. And not only gasping for air, if you listen to their lung sounds, you're going to get a lot of gurgly, bubbly movement. And if you listen to the heart sounds, almost sounds like a horse galloping. OK, what could possibly cause respiratory distress? There are many variables. Trauma can cause it, a pneumothorax, hemothorax, barotrauma. Congestive heart failure can also cause respiratory distress, cardiogenic shock, even a myocardial infarction. Take the case of the brain-injured patient whose respiratory center has obviously been affected. Then we have adult respiratory distress syndrome, which is brought on by other things like trauma, near drowning, COPD, asthma, pneumonia, bronchitis. This patient here in the second half is showing signs of hemothorax. She's very short of breath. Respirations are very rapid. Oxygen saturation is low. She's got that bluish tinge to her skin. And obviously now she's got some oxygen on to help her breathe. This can happen after a patient's had a trauma. All of these conditions all lead up to respiratory distress. In itself, it's not considered to be just one condition on its own. We're going to talk a, lot, a little bit more about the patient in adult respiratory distress syndrome. And like I said, there are numerous topics on respiratory conditions if you go to uh, the clinical settings step-by-step, dearnurses.net. This patient is in ARDS, another name. ARDS is adult respiratory distress syndrome. It's sometimes called white lung. And um, patients in this condition are, often, are usually restless, agitated because they're having difficulty breathing. In this case, you can see here, this man is very agitated. His respirations are rapid. The alarms of the ventilator are going off. Oxygen saturation is down. The nurse calls the doctor, and he arrives, and he gives orders to have some arterial blood gases done to confirm the diagnosis. So gases are done, and this patient is found to be hypoxic, which is, again, lack of oxygen to the blood cells. And then we have him. The diagnosis confirms typically in ARDS they have what is called white lung, white patches all over the lung. What could bring on such a condition? Massive blood loss, 
blood transfusions, I take that back, sorry, massive blood transfusions, pancreatitis, oh yes it can, trauma, sepsis, pneumonia. Obviously this patient um, is look, resting very comfortably here, number four. Reason being, whatever problems he had were addressed. He was given sedation. He was, uh, his ventilator settings were adjusted. He was also given something called NMB, which is a neuromuscular blockade. Since some hospitals, they don't like using it as much as they used to before. What it does is it paralyzes the muscles, so it makes it easier for those patients rather than fight the ventilator. The only problem is it has to be given along with sedation. You cannot give a neuromuscular blockade without sedation and without a patient being on the ventilator. So if you have that ordered by a doctor, things like Pavulon, you have to make sure that patient is on the ventilator so that you will have some assistance for respirations because it's going to put them out when they start breathe, trying to breathe and also make sure you uh, have got some sedation because these patients, their muscles are paralyzed, but they're still aware of what's going on around them and someone described it as being buried alive. So make sure they have some sedation in addition to the neuromuscular blockade and ventilatory support. CPR. <clears throat> yes, it happens to all of us. No one, sometimes we're not always prepared for what's going to happen for the patient on, with CPR. In the case of this patient, he's in the intensive care, he's awake, he's alert. But we have to understand something. Some patients do have obvious problems, pending diagnosis like a coronary artery problem. And even though he may be sitting up looking alert, he has the potential for going under. So being stable does not mean that everything is fine. You can be stable, but it does not mean everything is going great. Of course, the nurse just looks in on him, and there he is. She's saying to him, uh, can you hear me? He's not breathing. So what do you do? You actually, if you look at the alarm, the, it's going off, and look at the monitor, you will see there's one of those uh, coarse wavy lines we talked about in another tape, another session, which is uh, ventricular fibrillation, which very often happens with the patient in cardiopulmonary arrest. So the nurse uh, does what? She, because she's alone and there's no one else there, she goes to the phone and calls for help, presses the code button and calls for help, and then she proceeds to start CPR on this patient. So there is a sequence in which things are done. You make sure you call for help if you're all by yourself because what are you going to do when things get out of control? So you press that code button. In a lot of institutions, there is a code button in ICU in every single patient's room or near to the bedside. Make sure you press the code button, call for help, and then you proceed to do CPR because you know you're going to have that backup. Now, if you want to know, like I told you, there's so many variables with respiratory problems. You, so I urge you to go to dearnurses.com and read Head to Toe Assessment Part 2, or go to dearnurses.net, take the clinical settings step by step, and sift through the different chapters, because there are numerous topics of interest on respiratory distress, or what might lead to respiratory distress. So stay posted for more clinical issues coming soon. And I hope you've learned something from this session. Have a great weekend.